Okay, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague, Josh Epstein. Uh, Josh uh, uh, grew up in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, where he studied at the great colleges and universities uh, there. <laughs> he uh, went on to MIT and uh, earned a, a PhD there, uh, did a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, I met Josh when he was at Brookings. Uh, Josh was at Brookings as a senior fellow for many years, and uh, there we had the opportunity to uh, form a research center and to build the kinds of models that will be on display for the next uh, next couple of days. So welcome, Josh. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Thank you all. This is such a pleasure. I, uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the, the past, the present, the future, and uh, I've called this agent-based modeling from napkins to nations, in a reference I'll clarify. But first and foremost, welcome. Rob and I welcome you all. We never imagined an event like this uh, all those years late ago when Growing Artificial Societies was published in, in 96. Um, we considered other titles. Uh, we considered artificial social systems, but the acronym was obviously unfortunate, so <laughs> <clears throat> we didn't do that. The title was a bit of a double entendre in that uh, it was an attempt to show, you know, how to grow artificial societies, but it also expressed a hope that artificial societies as a method would grow, and this Congress shows that it has beyond our wildest imaginations. The range of presentations, I'm sure you've seen the program, the proliferation of tools, curricula, the deep effects on fields from epidemiology to archaeology to economics is just fantastic. And I feel like the, we're really only entering the mature phase of this science. So let's have a great two days and take the momentum with us out of here. Uh, I thought today I would do kind of a Josh's eye view of the past, talk a little about the origins of the whole thing, talk about work that I've been doing very recently, and then discuss the, the future and talk about the scientific agenda I have in mind, and then talk about a couple Hilbert problems that Rob and I thought it would be fun to have the conference develop new questions for the field. And so I will throw out some Hilbert problems. Stu Kaufman, our, our dinner speaker, <clears throat> speaks only in Hilbert problems. Uh, or maybe it's just a Hilbert problem to figure out what he's saying. I'm, after all these years, I'm, I'll leave that to, for you to judge at dinner. Uh, and then also talk about some extra scientific challenges um, for, the, for our community. So the origins of our work, of Rob and my collaboration, really go back to this thing, the 2050 Project. John Steinbrunner, our great protector, who died uh, last year, hired me at Brookings and in, in the late 80s. And one day, he invited me to a workshop at this new place, the Santa Fe Institute. Let's go see what this is about, John said. And I thought, sure, let's go. So we went to Santa Fe, and there I met Murray Gell-Mann and George Cowan, Bill Anderson, John Holland, and other founding fathers of the Institute. The workshop, the topic, of course, was everything. That's our only topic at the Santa Fe Institute. But, uh, but it was called Sustainability to the Year 2050. So we joined forces, Santa Fe Institute, Brookings, and the World Resources Institute, and decided to approach the MacArthur Foundation for some funding to do this. And uh, I remember meeting George and Murray in Chicago and taking a very cold ride to headquarters to convince the MacArthurs that we actually could take a crude look at the whole, in Murray's wonderful phrase. And we got this grant and uh, went back to our, to our, you know, to our homes. And I remember, my wife Melissa will remember, I was standing in the kitchen of our little house in Cleveland Park when Murray Gelman called and asked me if I would be direct the theoretical work. And I'm sure Murray, neither of us had the foggiest idea what that meant, but I felt anointed and, of course, agreed, subject to the constraint that I don't have to order tuna sandwiches for anyone or do any administration. Um, <clears throat> so there I was, the the director of the theoretical group on this project. About that time, I gave a talk at Carnegie Mellon. And in fact, Herbert Simon gave one, and I gave the other. It was the only time I met Herb Simon, and I'm sure he'd have thought this was a wonderful occasion. I regret that he's not here to enjoy it with us. But at Carnegie Mellon, using very passe methods, uh, nonlinear dynamics, I showed that highly imperfect collective security regimes could stabilize very volatile arms race dynamics. Uh, a couple days later, I went back to Brookings. A couple days later, I got a call from this doctoral student who was at the talk. And he said he tried to implement the model, 
couldn't replicate the results. I thought, great, this kid has the technical chops to try to replicate the thing, and the chutzpah to call me and say he couldn't do it. So I thought, well, and it turns out, of course, this is, the kid was Rob Axtell. And I invited him down to Brookings to straighten it all out, which we did. And when Rob went back to Carnegie Mellon, I raced into John Steinbrunner's office and I said, wow, this guy was super, a great guy. And John said, well, hire him. Hire him on the 2050 project. So I offered Rob a position and he accepted. And there we were, the theoretical group, Rob and me. I had no guidance of any sort on what to do, except this vague idea that it should support sustainability, also undefined. But we really were wrestling with sort of what is the simplest thing we could think of to get something going. And one day, in the Brookings cafeteria, after everyone had left, we came up with the idea of let's, let's build a simple hunter-gatherer society on some abstract resource landscape. And we both remember the first sketch of that model on little Brookings napkins, and I remember the black ink bleeding into the paper with wiggly little concentric circles and stick figures, and what are they going to do? And literally, the simplest thing we could dream up was look around, find the spot with the most resource, go there, and eat it. And I wish we'd kept that napkin, uh, but in hunting around, I did find version 0.0, .0 of the code, and I've had this nicely reproduced and bound, and it's dated October, October 14, 1992. Uh, <coughs> and it reads, it reads, Robert Axtell and Joshua Epstein, version 0.0, .0 October 1992. It wasn't called Sugarscape or anything but Hunters at this point. I also want to give David library, um, whatever, whatever, anyway, um, so this is, the, this is the code, the original code, and uh, I, how could there be? <clears throat> anyway, so I, that's, so 1992, actually, if we'd waited another year, it would be the 25-year the, the anniversary, but in any event, I thought that was, I, I'm happy to find that. At that time, the computing was very primitive by, by contemporary lights. I mean, you'll see, like, the code was written in just native Pascal. Object-oriented programming hadn't even been invented yet. There were no handy graphics tools, graphics libraries, and we wrote all this horrible code in the Mac toolbox, ResEdit, all this other stuff. There were, there were no agent-based modeling languages. NetLogo, Repass, Swarm, Mason. It was really a wilderness from the point of view of the technology compared to today. Now there are all these tools, and it's very easy to do agent modeling badly. You can just get on NetLogo, and in a couple hours, you're a bad agent-based modeler. For us, it was hard to do badly, but we did it nonetheless badly. And I thought it would be fun just for old time's sake to show the, the Sugarscape model that everyone seems pretty familiar with, but I think, honestly, that many of the themes we got interested in are present and they've endured as questions for the field. And this model, for those of you who might not have seen it, is simply the yellow stuff here is a space of renewable resource sites. They're grown back to their capacity, the darker the yellow, the higher capacity, four, three, two, one. Uh, agents have local vision and they have a metabolism that that's how fast they burn sugar. Everybody gets a little sugar at the beginning. They inspect the sites within their vision, go to the site with the max sugar, eat it. We up their sugar wealth by that amount, decrement it by their metabolism. If the result is negative, they die. Otherwise, they repeat. And quite a lot happens with that simple rule. I mean, I remember just being surprised every time we did anything. We had to think about, what is it with this guy? He's not doing anything. We thought, oh, that, that, that guy has lousy vision. But he also has a very forgiving metabolism. So he can just sit there and eat and digest and eat and digest. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't move to Wall Street. He doesn't, you know, he's just not a, he's a loser. But he's out there, all right? Uh, and then other, other exercises were surprising, the same rules. I remember we put everyone clustered in the lower left-hand corner, and they go in a diagonal wave in the successive waves. And it, the rules, the individual rules, were just you, you can only go north, south, east, and west. 
You're not allowed to go on the diagonal as an individual, but the group does go on the diagonal. Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe you call that an emergent phenomenon. But we looked closely at it and had to think about it. And, thought, oh, and moreover, why are they successive? Oh, because the guys are waiting for the sugar to grow back before it's worthwhile to move again. <clears throat> but again, the main point is it was just surprising. Mo most surprising, perhaps, was the distribution of wealth. Um, so agents are accumulating sugar all the time. So there's some distribution of sugar, sugar wealth, that's unfolding on this landscape. So let's have a look at it. And I, Rob and I had no particular presumptions at the time. We didn't know what this would look like. Start with a, just a random distribution. And we were very surprised when it self-organized, as it were, into a Pareto law, one of the characteristic regularities in modern industrial economic societies. And I remember, as Rob remembers, showing this to the Brookings trustees at one point and uh, among them were Robert McNamara, who was at then point the World Bank president, and Pamela Harriman, <clears throat> complete, I think, literally with a leopard skin pillbox hat right out of Dylan's uh, song. But um, John Steinbrenner, when he saw this, he said, that's important. And it really was one of the first indications to us that agent-based models could be actual scientific instruments where you posit rules, generate regularities, compare the regularities to statistics and do empirical work. <clears throat> but the main thing I remember about all of it was that it was just ecstasy. You know, it was just a joy and an incredibly thrilling time. And I felt that we had discovered a kind of treasure. You know, we'd call each other from wherever we were, and every time we added a move, it did something new and great and riveting and spellbinding. And, you know, it would select revision and metabolism. We showed the inheritance of wealth retards evolution of attributes, retards selection, able to get assimilation of groups, combat, non-equilibrium markets, evolving preferences, you know, unified immunology, epidemiology. It was all very conceptual, but the thing just pulled us along. It was very hard to stop, even when it was done. And when it was done, we, we allowed ourselves just two appendixes. Um, one of them, was a version of the shelling segregation model. And uh, after the Sugarscape model was built, we learned about the segregation model in an urban economics paper by Vandell and Harrison. Rob described that model to me, and it sounded very interesting. And we both felt that uh, the segregation model was a homogeneous agent's model, not a real heterogeneous agent model. But Rob thought, let's generalize it, so he did, and we wrote it up as an appendix. And it appears in that book, and the shelling model is very important. It's parsimonious, beautiful, seminal, prescient, all of which we acknowledge with the greatest affection and admiration for Tom. But it just had nothing to do with Sugarscape. Um, and I've always worried <clears throat> that it would be impolite to point this out when people assume, as they normally do, that we studied that model and based the Sugarscape model on it. But at this remove, I trust that it is not employed. Just true. But I thought it might be a decent occasion to just set that record straight. All right, on with the tale. At one of these 2050 meetings, I showed something we called the proto-history, which is an artificial history of a civilization in which two tribes start out centered on hilltops and expand through population growth down into the valley between them and they interact, flipping each other's tags, producing cultural groups, fighting over sugar. And I asked the group uh, at Santa Fe, does this remind you of anything? And George Gummerman reminds me of the Anasazi, he said. And this, I didn't know what that was, the Ana what, I said. And, and he just told me it was this ancient civilization that ebbed and, ebbed and flowed and lived from 900 A.D. to 1300 A.D., and I, of course, said, well, that's fine. You archaeologists and your dusty pants and pot shards and the rest of it, do you have any data? And he said, yeah, amazingly, they had a ton of data on three-by-five cards at the Southwest Archaeology Research Group. Uh, okay, 
let's digitize that history and see if we can grow it in an agent-based model. And again, you know, at the time, it just seemed crazy and audacious to try that. Um, <laughs> but we did, and after several years and of teams of, you know, ragtag teams of people, we achieved that. And in the course of this work, because the whole project was supposed to have this futuristic 2050 flavor, we enjoyed calling it the 1050 project because of its ancient focus. And of course, this is where the ancient Anasazi lived. And we gave them very simple sugar scapey rules. You know, it was a very much of a sugar scape, except it was a maze scape and there was water and you had to figure out where to live and where's a good place to farm. And if your farming's terrible, when do you move? And, you know, for very, very simple rules. And we were able to generate on the left is the true history and on the right <coughs> is the artificial history. Um, or maybe it's the other way around. But in any event, they do intelligent things and settle where they should. And we published a paper in the proceedings in 2002 giving this, this fit. And there are many concrete applications of agent modeling collected in a book of mine, 2006. And here, I think, is, you know, a mature articulation of the epistemology, what is generative social science, a mature scientific instrument, the agent-based model, and diverse applications. So it's what's the, what do we mean by an explanation in this epistemology? What scientific instrument permits us to give explanations of that sort? And what are some examples of explanations? And in the book, there are a variety of applications, civil violence, classes, retirement economics, organizations, other things. But that book ended with a challenge kind of to myself, and the challenge was grow Raskolnikov, by which I meant an agent with inner conflicts and dimensions and whose individual behavior is the resultant of emotional and deliberative and social forces, some of which he may not even be aware of. And my response to that was this creature that I call Agent Zero, um, and I spent really five years of work on this and didn't give any intermediate talks and publish no intermediate papers. I just, every day, my little iPhone would go off and it would say, get to hell to work on your thing. And I did. And uh, I was lucky to have a five-year award. We'll come back to that. But the idea, again, let's just, is generative explanation. The title is Neurocognitive Foundations for Generative Social Science. And just to go, just take a minute. When you say you've explained something, a generative explanation to explain a social regularity, a wealth distribution, a settlement pattern, some other stationary thing, or even a non-equilibrium thing, demonstrate how it could emerge on time scales of interest to humans in a population of cognitively plausible agents. Does that micro-specification, the population of plausible agents, micro-specification M, generate the macroscopic explanandum? If so, M is a generative explanatory candidate. So the motto is a negative motto. If you didn't grow it, you didn't explain it. For every X, not grow of X implies not explain of X, right? Not the converse. You might grow the thing in all sorts of stupid ways that are obviously not explanatory. The Anasazi stumbling around, drunk, moving backwards, they might end up in the right positions, but that's not a good explanation. It's not a plausible rule, not a plausible generative specification, and something that is a candidate might not be unique. There might be many of those that suffice to generate the phenomenon, in which case there's more work to do comparing them. You may have to devise new experiments to distinguish those or collect new data, but that's not that's the case in any science. Um, so generative sufficiency is a necessary but not sufficient condition for explanation, but it's a very different notion than the notion in kind of mainstream mathematical social science. And in particular, you have a regularity. What's an explanation? I furnish a game in which the regularity is an equilibrium, is a Nash equilibrium. Or if it's a trajectory, I furnish a functional, a la Gary Becker and this pedigree, uh, a functional with respect to which that trajectory is an extremal. And we're saying, no, I really want to know 
how it could happen in a distributed, heterogeneous population of cognitively plausible agents. And what are those? Cognitively plausible agents have emotions, they have bounded deliberative capacity, they have social connection, and all of those might matter. So I, in the book, I actually had the occasion to read a lot of Hume and other philosophers. And Hume famously said, reason is a slave to the passions. And Aristotle and many others said, man is a social animal. So I was looking in this book for a very simple convolution of passion, reason, and social influence in an agent. But it had to be formal. Uh, lots of criticism of the rational actor. There's mountains of psychology saying humans don't act like that. And, you know, this is a, but, but, but they don't change scientific practice. Mere demonstrations that the thing is false actually don't lead people to abandon the reigning formalism. You need an explicit formal alternative, and Agent Zero is one. It's a provisional proposed alternative, but that is mathematical and computational. And I've, all the code is, I did one version in math and one version in agents, and all that code is available on the site. So it's all replicable completely and extensible. And I, I always say, you know, you may, you're welcome to think it's all baloney, but it's re replicable baloney. So that's, that's the first test, all right? Um, and I'm not gonna go under the hood and really tell you in this time how much time I have, what's going on. But the basic idea is that if these are agents and some of them, this agent will be immobile in the lower south west of the landscape, and these other agents of the same agent zero type move around in a very scary part of the, of the world where there, where there are attacks on them. Think of these orange things as attacks. But they could be losses of value. They could be adverse reactions to a vaccine. They could be all kinds of things. But if you think of it in a kind of compact, combat context, they're up here in a scary part of the world where they're being ambushed all the time, and they're making a judgment. They are fear conditioning on yellow people are here, some of them blow up, and they're, they're making an unconscious association between the indigenous population and an aversive thing, like getting blown up. And unconsciously, they're fear conditioning on that and associating yellowness with danger. They're also making a crude calculation of what's the relative frequency of orange sites to yellow sites in my vision. They're just making the probability judgment. What's the probability that a random yellow is an enemy that's a ba very boundedly rational calculation because it exhibits base rate neglect and the representativeness heuristic in which you mistake the local sample for the global sample. But it's a boundedly rational calculation. So the fear part is happening through unconscious just association. Uh, they're also making a deliberation. The sum of those is their disposition to destroy sites, which is this black blood-colored event but they're connected to one, one another by weights that are calculated endogenously in the model. So these guys are getting scared and convinced that the population is their enemy. This person has never experienced any bad behavior by any yellow person he's ever come in contact with. But through dispositional contagion, he wipes out his village too. And more interesting, I think, the darkest of these parables I was able to generate, I call them parables, is where he's never experienced anything bad and he leads the lynch mob. He leads the Holocaust. He goes first without any aversive stimulus. Is he a leader or is he just susceptible to the fear of other people, the dispositions of other people? Since, since uh, in the model, there's, n there's no actual imitation of behavior. I mean, the first person can't be imitating anyone's behavior because no behavior has happened before the first person. So the whole issue of the first actor is kind of an interesting conundrum for the social sciences, and Agent Zero is one way of handling that. Is, the leader, is, he, the, is he the leader or is he just susceptible? And Tolstoy's answer is just susceptible. <laughs> he writes, a king is history's slave performing for the swarm life. I love that he used the word swarm for those of us in the Santa Fe pedigree. Um, <clears throat> and it's impolite to read from your books, but one, in, I want to read this little section. Uh, 
from the Agent Zero book. The overall picture of Homo sapiens reflected in these interpretations of Agent Zero is unsettling. Here we have a creature evolved, that is, selected, for high susceptibility to unconscious fear conditioning. Fear, conscious or otherwise, can be acquired rapidly through direct exposure or indirectly through fearful others. This primal emotion is moderated by a more recently evolved deliberative module, which, at best, operates suboptimally on incomplete data and whose risk appraisals are normally biased further by affect itself. Both affective and cognitive modules, moreover, are powerfully influenced by the dispositions of similar, equally limited, and unconsciously driven agents. Is it any wonder that collectivities of interacting agents of this type, the agent zero type, can exhibit mass violence, dysfunctional behavior, and financial panic. So many runs and extensions are given in the book. There are a few, a bunch more are outlined in a, in a, a chapter by myself and Julia Chellen in a nice edited volume uh, edited by Alan Kerman and D.S. Wilson. Rob has a chapter there, and Blake has, I don't know whether you were in that book or not. Yes, whatever. You, uh, <laughs> But lots of people do, and it's a very nice collection that tries to bring complexity and evolutionary thinking to economics. <clears throat> Not for the first time, but. Uh, and my agenda is, I think, to deepen these agents, improve the components neuroscientifically, scale the population up so that we they're, populate large models with these agents. What are some of these large models? Uh, one of them that I've worked on are things like this, a complete three-dimensional Los Angeles. I wish we had a little lower light. No way to do that. Um, anyway, what you're seeing is a completely detailed three-dimensional Los Angeles. Um, and this is uh, an aerosol, a toxic, toxic plume. And the, flu the fluid dynamics, the computational fluid dynamics are completely kosher computational, you know, atmospheric physics. The buildings are structural engineering. They're completely correct. They, we know their permeability, occupancies, all these other things. And the traffic is color-coded for normal traffic velocities. And the issue is what, you know, what is a good, what is a good policy? Everybody shelter in place. Everybody race out of the buildings and leap in your car. Some people leave. Some people go. If they go, how do they go? Do you do carpooling? What directions are restricted? You know, there's a complicated problem, a complicated problem to what's the optimal design of an evacuation. Here's a tool to do that. And, of course, what it shows, among other things, is if everybody simply leaps out into the middle of Los Angeles, you get congestion and increased exposure. So if everybody tries to evacuate, they might do worse on it. Here are some other views of that. Um, upper left is the same picture. Upper right, looking down on the plume. On the left, another view. And on the right, the measure of merit. How many agents are exposed, and what is the exposure in parts per million per second? So. We're at a point where we can do work synthesizing computational fluid dynamics, agent-based computational modeling, urban structures and adaptations and what have you. I mean, there's, a lot, there's synthetic work that, that I think is very important that populates these models with cognitively plausible agents but has them embedded in real environments. Uh, other work on contagion, contagious dynamics, this is work really by John Parker. Uh, published in Tomax, the U.S. national epidemic model, 300 million agents, correct to census code data. The movement is all calibrated to uh, zip code to zip code transportation. We have that data. It's, there are 30,000 zip codes, and so if it's, you know, what's the probability that, that Joe in zip code I goes to location zip code K? That's a 300 squared, you know, a, a 900 million cell matrix, and 30,000 squared. So that's a lot of manipulation, but it's all doable. And agents can be given those kind of characteristic stylized itineraries. We start, this is an H1N1 swine flu run with parameters provided by NIH, and it starts in California. Black is healthy, red is sick, blue is recovered. Everything bad starts in California in my models. 
Um, and we've used this in a variety of settings on, on a variety of diseases. And even beyond that, also, I could give John complete credit. Uh, this is a global epidemic model, 6.5 billion individual agents. And we start this particular bug in, in Asia. And you can study, you know, flight restrictions or where to put biosurveillance or how to distribute vaccine and, you know, a million things. But again, you know, behavior matters hugely in epidemic dynamics, whether people refuse vaccine or disobey orders or violate quarantines or all kinds of things. And uh, agent-based modeling has, has developed to the point where you can build global-scale models populated by sentient beings who act in ways that are important for policy and public health. So to me, uh, one line of advance, one science agenda, is to develop these extreme-scale agent-based models populated by cognitively plausible agents, calibrated to large-scale data, and applied to big problems in health, security, economics, environment, inequality. That strikes me as a coherent and feasible agenda that, that I'm excited to pursue. We did agree to have some Hilbert problems, so I'll throw out uh, three Hilbert problems. One is grow the Ten Commandments. And what I mean by that, I guess one way that I've been futzing around with this. So one idea is that you could think of, en of ethical codes as a kind of inner product of a deontic vector and an action vector. So, you know, if the action vector is kill, honor thy father and mother, then the deontic operators would be not possible <laughs> and not possible to not. Burke's thinking, but the point is that there is, a, there is a notation, a modal logical notation that invites a representation of ethical codes and one could imagine selection pressures operating on the population of codes and having ethical codes compete and in some settings you don't really need to honor your father or mother. Or you can chase your neighbor's wife because there's food everywhere and you don't have to cooperate. All right? Whatever it is. But grow the Ten Commandments. Another is uh, what is, I think this is a deeper and more important question, what is the analog of structural stability for agent-based models? So we're always asked sort of, well, you know, those rules, you made up those rules, and, you know, they're all ad hoc, and you just pulled them out of thin air. And what about it? And you'd like to be able to answer, oh, that's true. But within a whole neighborhood of rules, I get the same result. Neighborhood of rules. What does that phrase mean? Right? Can we develop a metric structure that applies to micro-specifications in their own right so that you can claim that the thing is not just stable to changes in parameters, but that it's stable to changes in form, which is the idea of structural stability in dynamical systems. There's a phase portrait that has a topology, and the topology is preserved through variations in the function space itself. So what does that mean? Can we make, put, make that formal and then have a notion of small change in rules and stability under small change in rules, not just small change in numbers? Um, third, what are the formal alternatives to the rational actor? That we should, that a, a workshop or a, a, a summit or something. I mean, I've, found a few that I use in Agent Zero, but it would be really useful to put these modules to, in one place and have a kind of constructions kit for cognitively plausible agents, where you could grab the module, use it as the effective piece, or make them heterogeneous by that piece, or introduce, you know, 24 Bayesians into the thing. What difference do they make? But build the construction kit so the models are easy to assemble, but all have this nice property that they're cognitively rich. And that would facilitate teaching. Uh, we have some nice talks. I know my friend and colleague Tanya Lees from Amherst is here to talk about this. Hi. Uh, 
But as a mode of inquiry, modeling instills very important habits of mind and should be part of the undergraduate education, the liberal arts education, skill sets, of course. But to me, I th the goal of education is actually freedom, right? To the ability to think on your own, to ask good questions, to insist on evidence, to be consistent, to demand consistency, and all of those things. And modeling, shareable, accessible modeling, serves that, serves those goals, develops those habits, encourages dialogue based on that. Another challenge, just wrapping up, is, is funding. I mean, uh, there are very, very few sanctuaries for unfettered scientific inquiry. I mean, Rob and I were just incredibly lucky to have protectors, John Steinbrunner and Bob Lighton at Brookings, and we had five years, probably more than five years, of really blue sky freedom. I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't have a, a plan for this. We were just allowed to explore and discover and invent. And, you know, it's produced something useful. Agent Zero, I was also very lucky to have a, diff a different five-year grant. And I, w that was also completely blue sky. Uh, artificial life, lots of things that happened at the Santa Fe Institute happened because people were free. People were free to just talk to each other and explore and, and do things that didn't work out. It's important to be, em, empower research that can fail. I mean, most funders want proof that the work will succeed. How do you know this will work? I don't know it will work. If I knew it worked, I wouldn't care about it, right? That's not the point. You know, and all of this apparatus about Gantt charts and the rest of it is just antithetical to the kind of fundamental invention that I've seen and maybe been lucky enough to participate in. Need another model. Uh, anyway, I think we've come a long way from the napkins. I think we now have a mature epistemology of generative social science, a mature scientific instrument, the agent-based model, to pursue this scientific agenda at all scales, from toy modeling to global modeling. There are, and I think we have a variety of transformative applications in economics, epidemiology, other important areas, land use, and all of these things. There are now some textbooks, curricula, platforms, programming tools, and a variety, a wealth of big questions. And we also have big data. The advent of big data is a, is a big deal. <laughs> Uh, to test these models. So Einstein said models should be as simple as models should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. That's Einstein's adage. So Epstein's adage is data should be as big as necessary, but no bigger. <laughs> we can all argue about that. In any event, as a young science, I think we've made amazing progress and have amazing momentum. And I know Rob would agree, this Congress is just way beyond what we ever would have dreamed of. And we're thrilled that it's happening. And let's have a great time for the next couple days and keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, please. So this is, I don't know if this is on, hopefully so. Um, so this is a question that's probably on a lot of young researchers' minds, even if we don't explicitly say it, but often we explicitly say it. Um, you mentioned uh, kind of funding for research that fails. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like that has kind of, of the funding that exists, the funding for research that is like perhaps likely to fail, do you feel like that's increased or decreased kind of over time? And how do we? I think it's being crowded out completely, and it's a disaster for disappointing. theoretical work. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm, you, you say, I, you know, Erez Hatton, my wonderful friend and colleague, thinks there should be more publications of research that fail. I mean, if you have a t sensible hypothesis and you took a sensible approach in testing it and the test says your hypothesis is wrong, that should be an article. You know, why should somebody else go down the, you know, if you've said this is a path that doesn't work, that's helpful. That's progress. That's science. You applied the scientific method. You reached an intelligent and important conclusion. That should be publishable. I mean, it's always this pitch about how it's all going to, how I can deliver the deliverables and Gantt charts and all this other, you know. <laughs>
how how do we solve that? Could we like convince someone to create a journal of failed research? <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, everyone tells me I must be publishing. But there's some great titles for for a, for a journal like that. It could just be fail, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm toying with that. I don't know. But I, th- I think that should be an admissible form of publication. And I mean, a lot of the great models in history are, you know, are wrong. Bohr's model of the atom is wrong. But it was important. Uh, Mitch Waldrop. Uh, uh, I'll ask the obvious question, uh, especially in light of the recent election and so forth. Uh, what uh, do your models tell us if they do uh, about... You know, this rise of populist rage against the elites and, you know, the sort of worldwide phenomena that we're still struggling to understand. And if they, your models don't tell us, what would be required to get answers about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the models, I mean, if you're talking about a situation in which emotions are dominant, arguments are scarce, the use of evidence uh, is not, you know, is not front and center. That I think there's a, I think there is a real collapse in dialogue, and that's politically meaningful. So I do think the models show that. I mean, Agent Zero is an agent driven by fear. He's conditioned by fear and manipulated by fear, and he doesn't know he's being manipulated by fear. And countering that is a module that's got very poor data that he doesn't know how to handle very well. And so his binary voting choice is driven by those. And I think you're seeing that. So I think it's modelable. I have one more question. I think you could expand this work. I think you could expand on the political aspect by rediscovering McLuhan, the effect that communications media have on social structure, social communication, and uh, group formation. I I think there's a lot of, for want of a better word, tribalization taking place, where where people form tribes that talk only among themselves, and that becomes a self-reinforcing mechanism that overrides evidence if it can even be presented. McLuhan talked about that 50 years ago. I think we could model it now. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Doug. I agree. I mean, I think that's all part of a completely you know, sensible agenda for modeling human behavior, and I agree. Thank you.